Good morning. This is the Research Papers Competition sponsored by the MLB. And my name is John Kendall, and I'm on the Sloan Research Papers team. And I'm excited to introduce you today Javier Fernandez, who will be presenting Wide Open Spaces, a statistical technique for measuring space creation in professional soccer. So the presentation will last 20 minutes, and then we'll have a five-minute Q&A session. And during the Q&A section, please raise your hand if you have one, and we'll bring a microphone to you. And now, please join me in welcoming Javier Fernandez. So hello, guys. Um, today, we would like to present this project we have been working on since last year. Uh, where the main idea has uh, to try to quantify this concept of space creation in soccer. So as a brief history of the usage of statistics in soccer, we have that we're definitely very far away from the current state of basketball and baseball and so on. So uh, soccer coaches today are being presented with lots of production stats, things uh, such as passes, shots, aerial duels, things that typically are on ball events, and a few times are presented uh, within uh, without a context, right? So uh, as an example, for, for example, if you see this match in fir in where first Barcelona beats Man City 4-0, and then two weeks after, Man City beats Barcelona 3-1, and, and then you take a look uh, to these stats, you see that there's pro probably practically or non-correlation with the actual outcome of the match or what, it, what actually happened uh, with the uh, players or teams regarding performance. So uh, when we start thinking about what are coaches talking about, what are the questions of coaches uh, uh, about, we just find out uh, several things. Uh, coaches talk about things such as uh, covered areas, the, how they expand or shrink uh, according to time, and uh, most of the cases according to different contexts. We have things such as the passing profiles of players, always according to the context. So are the players doing their comfort pass? Uh, and what are, the, are they doing in different moments when they have the ball? So this is about on-ball events. You have some other concepts, such as dynamic structure of formation lines. How do this move? How you actually calculate those lines? What's the fallback time? How much does it take uh, to the lines to regroup after you have a lost ball? You have some other very typical concept that is during build-ups or goal kicks, how is the opponent defending that? How, uh, how are they placing to defend that? And how can we uh, come up about that to actually be closer to have a chance of goal? Another typical thing is about body or, uh, orientation. So how are players position their, their body so they can get the ball and then be able to progress and not have to pass the ball back and not being able to progress in the game. So in general, if you see this, there's a lot uh, of concepts that require tracking data, and some of all of these concepts are about off-ball movements. But there's a general concept that's a very typical thing uh, being said uh, by coaches in soccer and by uh, soccer experts all the time, that is about spaces. They, they, they talk about, uh, are you creating spaces? Are you moving spaces? Are you opening up spaces? How do we move in, in, uh, around that space? So to try to get an idea of the mindset of coaches, we just can borrow these words from Johan Cruyff. He said so many, so many years ago, and it's interesting. He said that it's proven that players, in average, have the ball three, three minutes, right? So the interesting thing is, what do you do those remaining 87 minutes when you don't have, have the ball? So based on this, yeah, um, we just have focus on trying to quantify two very interesting concepts uh, in soccer. The first one is space occupation as the idea of positioning into uh, places, into areas of greater spatial value. And the second one is that of space creation for teammates. So this is the act of attracting an opponent towards your position and then generating space there where the opponent was. So let, let's see a couple of examples of what is this. First, uh, how you gain space. We're going to focus on Paulinho, this, this, this player with a red circle. You will see that first he loses space and he tries to move toward a space of greater value to be able to get the ball there. So there, he's in a better space, and finally, he's able to get the ball. A second case, uh, it's a more simple one. He just follows the trajectory of the ball, but again, he's able to position himself towards a space in which he's able to have more control and be able to get the ball there. So now we have a more interesting case. You can see that now 
he's going to keep looking left to right and left to right and left to right to try to get an idea of the players surrounding him and trying to be in equal distance to the opponents. So in that moment, it's harder to get the ball, but he's still occupying this space of value and trying to gain that uh, value of space. So a last one. Uh, he again finds himself out of space, and he, and he get, and tries to gain that by moving backwards and trying to find an open position there, and again be able to get the ball. So this is the first concept, and the second one is a little bit more complex, but it also happens a lot in being trying to be trained uh, for players, and it's that of space generation. So let's focus now on Iniesta here, this player with the red circle. So you will see that first he moves backwards to try to gain some, some space and to be able to get the ball there. It's happening right now, it's gonna do it. But he's not able to get the ball there. So now he attacks this space and runs into the box, and in this, in this moment, he attracts opponent and he's creating space for Messi there that is going to be able to get the ball. So let's see this, this again. He will move backward, gain space, not able to get the ball there. Then he's going to run into the box and attract opponents right there, right? So now he's creating or generating that space for Messi. He's going to be able to pass the ball there. And now Messi has wide space to be able to do whatever he wants. He chooses to do a love pass, a very nice pass for Suarez, and then we have a very good uh, chance of creating, of, of, of goal. So when, when we think about this, uh, there's an underlying concept, and it's that of the quality of space, right? So if we're trying to gain space, there's a concept behind that that is uh, how valuable is the space I'm controlling in a, in a given moment. So we, uh, we think that we can express the quality of space as a function of two concepts. The first one is the pitch control or the level of control you have in certain lo location in a given moment. And the second one is the relative field value. That is, how val actually valuable is that space you're con controlling in that moment. So let's see how we try to quantify these two concepts and then get back again to quantifying space gain and space uh, generation for teammates. So regarding pitch control, uh, they have been th this one of the most typically used things in soccer, and there, you, you have several models there. The most common one is that of Voronoi Desolations. So this model has a handful of very useful things, such as it's very fast to compute, it can be, it can be built for a single frame. It typically does not account for players' velocity and the relative position of the ball, although you have some uh, uh, models in the last years that can account for, uh, for, uh, for that. A very nice one is that of William Spurman, yeah, that you, you have it in the last year, and also there's a poster of this year that is able to do a physics modeling to try to model that, that, that space in a, in a similar way as Boronoi. But um, when we're thinking about how we control space, there's something about this model that we think is not quite right for what we're trying to quantify. And that is that pitch, uh, sorry, Voronoi desolation assumes that for a given location on the field, there's one player that controls that location absolutely. So uh, for this concept, our desire model is one in which a given location on, on, on the field can account for different degrees of control for of different players. This is a position on the field can be influenced by multiple players in different degrees. And it's also a model that we would like to be fast to compute and be able to compute in a single frame, have some parameters uh, to, to play with it and to be able to adjust it to a uh, coach's um, perspective of the, of the game. So uh, when we try to quantify uh, the, this pitch con uh, control model, we just say that the control of a given lo location P in time is a function of the aggregate influence of players, of, of, um, uh, of teams, right? So for this, we used to use a logistic function uh, to try to get a zero one, uh, some sort of zero one probability of controlling space in a given moment. And the most important thing here is that function i that talks about the level of influence a player has on a location in a given moment. So the, the interesting thing is how to measure that. And what we're doing is placing on the player's position a bivariate normal distribution, zero one, normalize, then we're able to modify that distribution to account for player's velocity. We also 
modify the spread of the distribution uh, to account for the distance to, 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 to the ball. And then we also translate the player's position uh, a little bit to account for player speed. So let's take a look at how this looks. This is just going to place again on Iniesta. And you will see, if you follow that player, that when the ball gets closer to him, this, the spread of control gets smaller, and also now when he gets the ball and starts running, you have a modification of the distribution to account for a player's velocity in that domain. So we are trying to account of those places, those areas in space he's able to control in that moment. So once we have a way of modeling that influence of one player and we apply the previous expression, we have something like this. This is a surface of control for, for a given team that is taking into account the influence of every player in every, any given location on the field, as well as is, is, is able to be built for a single frame. Uh, we also were able to parallelize this and implement it in for U, GPU, so it, uh, you're able to get uh, this surface in real time. So now we have a way of quantifying the control of the field, which is a typical thing in soccer. It's better adjusted to what we are uh, expecting to have. But there's a second part of the expression, and it's that of the relative value of the field. So we're first based, in order to quantify this, we're just fa uh, basing on a very common belief in soccer, that is that a given field location has different value depending on context. So when you ask a coach's context can be many things. Uh, the type of attack you have in a given moment, um, the, the current score during that match. But if you get more granular, there are probably a very interesting variable uh, to take into account context is the position of the ball. So uh, we're trying, in order to quantify this, we're following the hypothesis that most of the times the opponent is positioned to cover the areas of greatest value. Yeah, so what this means is that if, if, if we take the influence of just the defending team given different positions of the ball, most of the time they will try to, to cover spaces they believe are of greater value. Right, so we just took 20, uh, 20 matches and trained a neural network to try to learn the re relationship between the position of the ball and the relative value of the field. So this is the way this looks. And you will be able to see that when the ball moves right to left, also the importance or the value of the field shifts right to left. And also where you get closer to the, uh, to the opponent's box, there's an increased value uh, in those areas surrounding the ball. So this has been learned uh, by seeing how the opponent is positioning every time. Great, so now we have a way of quantifying the quality of space. And we, get about, uh, we just get back again to our two uh, main concepts, that is how you quantify the space occupation gain, that gain in space. So we say that for a given time, time window, we're seeing the, in, the, the increase in gain in time, and we, see it and, and, and we say that if that gain is above a given threshold, you are gaining space of value. So uh, it's very important to recall here that in soccer, there's no kind of ground truth data or label data for spaces whatsoever, for space creation or for space movement. So we just gather uh, with coaches from FC Barcelona for several weeks from first team, second team, and youth teams and watch hundreds of videos to try to get to that threshold. But with, we're saying that we're actually seeing that concept of gaining space uh, through movements or through different ways. So another. Uh, the right concept is that of space generation gain, and what we're uh, identifying here is first the moment where a given player is attracting the opponent, and then if our teammate is having a gain in space, we're saying that this, this player is generating space for that teammate. Right? So once we have these two concepts, this is how this looks. You will see in green circles where the players, to, through movement, are having a gain in space. So they're moving into spaces of greater value. And you can see this happens sporadically, and it happens in di different moments. And for, uh, for example, here, Messi is able to see that Alba is gaining a very interesting space when, when running towards the, the box. He's able to get a pass there. And then, and then we have a, a nice goal that was actually a very important goal this season. So we can see it again. Uh, we can see that there's this green circles V mark. 
when the player's movements, and those are spaces in which uh, it's valuable to control, right? It's good to get the ball there or you're doing some kind of attraction of um, opponents there. Great, so um, this, this could be useful to, 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 to try to quantify season-wise statistics and evaluate players, but what we see now is that coaches are very interested in analyzing the previous match and also analyzing previous matches of opponents. So we tried to do a single match analysis here in a, in a match last year of Villarreal against Barcelona, and we have the following. These are the, the heat maps in the first row for the places where players are, were gaining space, and in the second row you have uh, uh, places where play, players were generating space. So for three players. You have in the, in the, in the first column, Sergio Busquets. Uh, the first, you're able to see his uh, able to occupy and to gain a lot of space of value in this mid lane of the whole field. The most interesting thing is that re regarding generation of space, he's able to generate space almost all around the field. So he's probably the best or the top three players uh, that has you know, this pivoting skill. This, that's a concept that, that can come to soccer uh, in the world. So he's able with movement and with position into generate space and, and, to, and to generate space of quality to almost every teammate and all around the field. So a second very different case is that of Gerard Piquet. You, you can see that in a very small uh, zone of the field, he's able to, uh, to gain space, but he's not able to generate space almost nowhere on the field. And that makes sense. It's not his mission. It's not his role uh, in the game. But both Piquet and Busquets are able to uh, generate space within the box, I mean, I mean inside the box, right? So when, when we take a look to that, and we're always trying to match data with videos, because we, we, we believe stats says things, but now in soccer it's very, very important to have the validation of coaches. Uh, when we see this, these clips, we can see that Busquets and and BK are generating space within the box in corner kicks and in free kicks. And they, it's interesting to see this because they actually have this role, this role of trying to get into the box and, and, and try to drag opponents there to generate space and then allow other teammates to head that uh, in, into the goal. So something additional you can see here and that we believe is of, of high value, it's uh, who is generating space for whom? So you have in the y-axis the space uh, generators and in the x-axis uh, space receivers. So several, several cases here. First one, again, Busquets, uh, he's able to generate space almost for any other player on the team, but he's also able to receive space from them. So he's moving all around and he's, able, he's been able to position himself onto, onto spaces of greater value along the, the, the match. So this is a match uh, for last season. You have Neymar, Suarez, and Messi playing, uh, playing together. And the interesting thing this shows is that it's not just about putting three skillful players on the attack and just winning games, right? They're able to generate space for each other in very different combinations. So a nice thing here is that moreover than seeing this heat map is uh, being able to see these clips and understand how are they generating space and if that actually matches what coaches are intending for them. Another case uh, is that you have here Seri Roberto is a right back in this match, and you have Lu Lucas Digne he was a left back. It was his first season uh, at the team. So interestingly, Digne is not able to generate space for no one. So you, you can say, okay, maybe this uh, can be due for many reasons, right? It could be that he's not doing a good job. He's not generating space, and some other players are. It could be that he's playing in the same lane as Neymar, and Neymar, uh, and, and Neymar is attracting so many players that he's not able to do that. Maybe it's just his first year and he's not knowing how to do that, he's not had that chemistry with the, with the team yet. Or maybe it's the actual role that the coach uh, given to him not to go there and not to generate space. So whatever the actual reason is, the interesting thing is that we can recognize that and try to provide the coach to better insight of how our players doing regarding this, their, their um, spatial movement. So if we, try to, if, if we try to rank these players according to the gain of space, and, uh, and we know that every ranking is, is, has, has issues, right? It's nice to, to see that the, the top three players, Iniesta, Busquets, and Messi, are probably three of the top five players in the world doing this, and they're also very Barca. The uh, DNA is nice for the model, probably seeing, seeing them there. But a more interesting thing is that 
if we structure, if we segment the, uh, the, the gain of space uh, into active and passive, we can see some nice things. So we say a player is gaining space actively if they're above jogging speed, and that the player is gaining space passively if, if, if he's jogging, walking, or standing. So if you see most players to have a seven, three, six to four relationship of generating more space actively than passively, but Messi has a three, seven. So it's like he's generating more space by jogging, walking, or standing. So if you take a look back to the last Clásico against Real Madrid in December, uh, this, this, this is what Spanish press was saying, things such as Messi spent 83% of a Clásico walking. His teammates are running for him, or Messi played a Clásico walking, or Messi, oh, how to win a Clásico walking. So it's interesting because we get back to a very common di discussion in soccer. We're, 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 we're still getting old with that, that is it about running better or running more? And we're still thinking in many cases that if you run more, you are performing better, right? So what we're seeing is that Messi is able to do and to, and to create great value by jogging, working, walking, or standing. So he's not just uh, being there and, and, and making the others run for him, but he's actually getting value. So let's see a clip of how he does this. So you got Messi there in this red circle, and you will see how he jogs a little bit away from the defenders and then walks into a position of great value to get the ball there. So he moves a little bit, and then he just walks. He's just running against the direction of the flow. Suarez can see that and take the ball for him. So he does this pass. Messi does a good shot. With a little bit of the goalkeeper help, we have a nice uh, goal there. Right, so just uh, wrapping up a little bit, uh, we have that there's um, critical importance in soccer and try to measure uh, different things and specifically try to focus on how we manage spaces, how we do through, through spaces. We definitely need better and more, uh, more de detailed model of how players move along this to be able to provide uh, coaches with clips or, and valuable stats that allow to analyze the performance of teams. So I was just going to borrow uh, a little phrase from Pep Guardiola to understand a little bit how important is this spatial moving uh, uh, for coaches in soccer. So he, he said one, we have to pass the ball, yes, but with clear intention. We pass it to drag players to one side and creating space in the opposite side. And then when we have done that, we move the ball there. That's our game. Thank you very much. And now it's time for a Q&A. Please raise your hand and we'll bring the mic. Hey, uh, just a quick question. So going back to the space generation and space receiving chart. So uh, I saw it interesting that Neymar didn't really uh, uh, receive a lot of space from other players, whereas uh, Messi received space from like, you know, the other two guys. Yeah. Uh, is that like, a way of like measuring, you know, if like defensive three guys, like are they working together if all three share, like given uh, receive space? Or is it just the fact that Neymar plays maybe more towards one side that he doesn't really either take advantage of the space or uh, or, or they just not, you know, generate space that, Yeah, him? yeah, it's a great question. So uh, pro probably if, if you get this heat map for the whole season, you will get a lot of, lot of colors there, right? Neymar being uh, generating space for many players and getting space for other ones. So the thing is that soccer, I, th I think specifically and probably because of his, of, of his current state, really needs to have a per match analysis now, right? So in this particular match, Villarreal is playing in a very particular way and he has very particular roles. So if you see that match, you can see ne Neymar is playing very, very uh, onto the left lane and is getting a lot, lot of players. Villarreal has two lines back, very, very, very close to each other. So it's very hard actually to get spaces uh, in that match. So the interesting thing there is that it's not about is Neymar doing, is, is Neymar good at this skill, but what was he doing in this match, right? So why he wasn't able to generate a, a space for Messi there. And if we know what he's supposed to, to do, we then can compare that to other matches and say, okay, he's, uh, he's not able to do this. Maybe he has, you know, a one-man marking. Maybe he's not playing, uh, playing well at all. So I think the actual question is try to get to the match there, try to get, uh, get to know um, 
why that's not happening and why there's more chemistry in that match of Suarez, Messi, and Neymar, Suarez than actually Neymar with the other two, right? It's just an inverse relationship, yeah. Um, really creative um, modeling and cool metrics. Do you see a lot of utility in applying the same sort of frameworks on the defensive end and um, occupying space and taking it away? This is Definitely. the last question, by the way. Definitely, yes. I think uh, that's, that's a definitely important next step. Uh, if you think about it, when we talk about why we need a model to quantify the level of, uh, of influence of each player on allocation, you can definitely think about that in a defensive standpoint, right? So if I'm close to someone, probably I'm taking some some, some space out of him there, but probably if I'm in an intermediate position, I'm taking space from two players there, right? So uh, there are many things that you, you, you could probably identify here, th things such as when are you doing actually high pressure, when are you marking several players. Uh, in some cases, for example, if you're marking Gareth Bale, probably it's not a good thing to mark him very closely because with a small long ball, he would just pass you by, right? So you can also evaluate per player and per match, uh, how are you marking in that way, and to have a level uh, or a degree of uh, how well are you controlling that, that space and taking that space out uh, from the opponent. Thank you, Javier Fernandez. Okay, thank you. Thank you.